Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a 12 o'clock block uh, and community matters. And this show is going to make you hungry and maybe frustrated too. Hungry and frustrated. <laughs> we have Cheryl Matsuoka. She's the executive of the Hawaii Restaurant Association. And she brought along two restaurant owners and entrepreneurs uh, and managers that we need to meet because we want to understand today what's going on with restaurants. You know, it's been a hard time for restaurants on both sides of the equation. It's not only that the restaurateurs and the staffs are having a hard time in COVID. It's that everybody, you know, this is a restaurant town. Some people live a good part of their lives, my wife and me included, at restaurants. We're eating out all the time. Hawaii is special that way. And we miss you guys. We miss you. Cheryl, tell us about the Restaurant Association and tell us who you brought along. Sure. I brought along Greg Maples. <clears throat> Greg is our current chairman of the Hawaii Restaurant Association. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a frog. And Greg is with the Palm Beach Culture Center. He is the director of restaurant services. I also brought along Russell Ryan, who is with Highway Inn. Everyone knows Highway Inn. There's a location in Ala Moana and a location over in Waikahu. Russell Ryan is the chief financial officer and chief commercial officer. Welcome to the show, Greg Maples and Russell Ryan. Nice to have you here, you guys. Thank you. Yeah. So um, why? Why? Um, you know, Cheryl, why do we care about the, whole, the Restaurant Association of Hawaii? Why do we care? We care about the Restaurant Association because we have over, we represent over 3,600 restaurants throughout all the islands, Jay. I'm talking, you know, the Big Island, Kauai, Maui, I mean, you go all the way down. We have, um, as you know, our current workforce, as the restaurants are closed, our current workforce force is um, unemployment. And we need to re-boost that work and open up our restaurants. Um, we want to do it safely. You know, our message is, of course, when it's safe to do so. But our restaurant tours are just waiting to open up safely. Okay, let's start with you, Russell. Uh, how's the highway in doing? Uh, what, 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 how have you suffered? How has your staff suffered? Uh, I know it's a ter terrible question to ask, but how's business? Yeah, well, uh, I wish it could be better, but for sure. <laughs> um, you know, to go, to go sort of briefly in chronological order, in March, it was the first two weeks were just a wasteland. But uh, little by little, they both picked up and they've kind of been steady ever since. Our town location is um, doing worse than our Waipahu location. We put that down to the difference in demographics. And, you know, because people in town are buying for themselves or their spouse. And people in Waipahu are buying for their families. Um, and so that they tend to be buying uh, bigger meals and our ticket size is bigger. But uh, so what Pahu settled on a higher revenue per a higher revenue per month than, than Kaka'ako has. But the bottom line for everybody is that no matter if you're making less than about 70% of your prior revenue, you're not covering all your costs. Um, and, and that is the big issue going forward. Um, restaurants, unless there's some government assistance with PPP or various other things, are going to start struggling pretty soon, because most of them are through their first round of PPP already. Um, so once that is once that is all washed out of the system, people are going to start looking at, at their fixed costs and thinking, how am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to pay my bank? Uh, because right now, I think it's fair to say that most restaurants have sort of settled into their, their, their sort of revenue level is matching to their labor and their food costs. So they can pretty much cover those things, but it's all the other stuff they're going to struggle paying. So that's, that's really how business is. Our staff, we've got, um, you know, during PPP, we kept everyone on payroll. Um, but after PPP, obviously, we've had to start cutting hours. So we're down to about half the total manpower in terms of full-time growth. And, and of course, um, you know, in, in the wait staff, um, they make uh, their money from tips also. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that tips must be suffering just the same way, huh? And, and yeah. PPP doesn't cover that. Well, you could you could use PPP for that um, if your math worked out okay. Um, uh, so we did a little bit of uh, tip sweetening with the uh, PPP, but not not a lot, and because um, we just couldn't. 
because you know with TPP there's various rules and restrictions you have to to manage. But the big thing, um, the big thing now is they're not making they're not making enough tips, so their salaries are considerably lower. I mean, our, our wait staff used to make a full time wait staff would make you know sixty to seventy thousand a year um, because of the the lucrative tips that they would get. Now they're you know at this current rate they're probably only making like twenty thousand a year. So that that is a big big issue, and of course tips come back when demand comes back. Yeah, of course. Um, so are, are, they, are you losing them? Are they moving off to other situations? Are they leaving town? It's a mixed bag. Yeah, we've got some that just leave and just want to go do something else. Some who stay at home. Some maybe have gone off to other islands, some back to the mainland. Um, generally, generally, it's sort of a mixed bag. But, but for whatever reason, we're running. I mean, we've had 20% resignations now. Of people just going off to other things so we'll have to do some rebuilding obviously but you know hopefully by then the uh the pool of applicants may be a little more vibrant than historically it has been mm. okay i, I want to come back to you on a variety of other things but let's talk uh, to greg for a little while greg you have a completely different situation at the polynesian cultural center can you describe it uh, yeah, it's devastating. Um, you know, we've been closed since March 16th, and we um, probably won't open at the earliest till October 1st. So we've we've gone uh, many many months with you know no no sales, and we've um, we've done a great job in the first uh, four months keeping all of our people whole, uh, paying them. Um, at one point, we did have to um, furlough. We furloughed 300. Um, people and uh, we're in the process of doing a, um, a look at what we're going to do next um, because we could we continue to to pay people and their and their salaries as well as their insurance and at the clip of a uh, two to three million dollars a month we don't have very much longer before we're going to have to make some changes wow what, how big is your operation i mean uh, uh, russell's got two locations um i what do you have 50 seats in each place russell Close to 100 in each. Oh, 100 in each. Okay. Greg, you, you sound like you have a lot more seats, huh? Yeah, so we have 1,600 employees at the Polynesian Cultural Center, and we feed on an average during our peak tech times between four and 5,000 people a day. Um, we, have a, we have a restaurant, Pounders, which is our full-service restaurant that seats um, about 237 people. And then we have our gateway buffet area, which seats probably around 2,000 people. And we have two luau venues that seat around 500 uh, seats each. And we have four luau's daily. Um, that includes all of our concessions. But so we've had to do some extraordinary things because of the, the problems that we've had out here. Uh, Pounders Restaurant is doing probably about 35% of their 2019 sales. So we're about 65, 70% down over prior year. Um, and the, the good news is we don't have any rent, right? We, we don't, we, we own our property. So without that rent, there's just, with, with, there is a way we can stay open by that. But if we had rent like everybody else, which is my biggest fear for our, our restaurant operators and owners is that not everybody has that, that, that what we do and they are struggling with that a lot. And, um, and I know we'll probably talk about this, but you know, the, the, one of the concerns we have also is this is the last week for the $600 feds plus up um, for unemployment. So you're going to have, what is it? 280,000 people that starting next week are going to get 600 a week less. That is going to affect the economy. It's going to affect our Kama Aina restaurants. Because right now we have a lot of people, and in some cases, and I know there's controversy on both sides, where they've been making more than what they did when they were when they were working. But what that's done is allowed some of those folks to go into the into the restaurants, into the retail, and purchase and do things. But with that coming off, that is a very big concern of ours. Wow. So uh, one one point. Um, so if you don't have rent, then your break even point. Um, you know. Uh, Russell was saying his break-even point is about what seventy percent. Um, depends on depends on the establishment, but um, seventy percent is is what we can run with now um, by virtue of um, <coughs> really interesting the SBA had loans 
and they offered uh, six months forgiveness. So with six months forgiveness, our um, break even is about 70%. Okay. What, what about you, Greg? What's your, without rent now, what's, what's your break even point? Yeah, probably about 70%. Uh, we, we, have to, we have to have about 30, uh, uh, 40% of our sales from 2019 for us to break even. Um, and, and, and we've, you know, we had a staff of well over a hundred people. We, we had a staff of about 33 in our restaurant. My division had 588 people in it um, pre COVID. And right now the, the division that I run has about um, 65 people. <laughs> so, so, so who, who decide, I mean, is it government deciding whether you're open or closed or you're deciding? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. If it was up to us, we'd be open all the time, right? We're only doing this because of the mandates and because of COVID-19. Um, and quite honestly, when this first started, we know that it was supposed to be a 14 day quarantine to help get our hospitals uh, in order and what have you. And it just, it just ballooned into one week to two, a month to two months, et cetera. And here we are, we, as a restaurant association, we were really keyed in on the August 1st opening day for tourism because that was our hope, right? It gave us hope that we could, that we could bring things back. A couple of things to remember. You've got a lot of chain restaurants, not all of them, but a lot of the chain restaurants are doing really well, okay? If you've got a drive through or you've, or you've got a delivery ability, you're ahead of the game, right? And you don't find a lot of drive throughs on, on these islands because of the cost of, uh, of land. So if you're, if you're more comma Ina driven, tourism is gonna be less impactful. But let's face it, everybody is impacted some way by tourism. But for our restaurants, these 3,600 restaurants, the majority of them are impacted by tourism. So when we, when we, when we finally got the date, which we worked very hard, Cheryl and her team did it, such an excellent job to get with the local and state government to tell them we have got to get open and finally we get this august 1st date to have it be pushed to september 1st is like putting a fist a hole the size of a fist in a balloon it just took everything out we have seen jay over and over every day reported restaurants closing businesses closing it has been my my um opinion from probably starting in April, that by the end of the year, you will see almost 50% of the restaurants close on all of our islands. And right now, we only probably have 50% of them open. If anybody's been to Maui lately, I, I took a trip with my family to Maui, and I was so sad by what I saw. One in 10 restaurants were open, nine out of 10 were closed. Shops just boarded up. It looked like I had gone to the off season of uh, Florida. It was, it was absolutely awful. Well, there's no yeah. tourism. There's no tourism. Yeah, and it's, so it's well, what, we, what it was. So let me, let me, uh, Russ, are you, are you in, in jeopardy of not being able to continue? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've got, I was looking at sort of how many months I could survive if there is not another um, government package come our way. And, you know, it's not going to be this year, but, uh, if we get to the spring, basically, if I get to the spring and nothing's changed, we, I, I start have to sell the property, my personal property, in order to uh, get the business to survive. I mean, it, it's that bad. I mean, there's, there's very little left. And when all that money is gone from selling a condo that I own, then that's it. That's, that's the end. So it, it really is, it, it really is, you know, it needs it needs some interim government money and this vaccine whenever it comes out needs to be coming out by the end of the year and it needs to be successful and it and without that uh, what greg talked about will come to pass and it may be even worse than that um because essentially what you find is the banks are not going to help you out um they they basically are going to cut their losses um there is very little from what i can see motivation for them to to help they would rather just collect their collateral and and be done. It's not, a, it's not a pretty picture. I mean, what, how about you personally? I mean, you, you seem rational and, um, you know, businesslike in, in discussing this stuff, but it's going to wreck your life, isn't it? Yeah, it, it would do if we got there. Uh, I, I have hope that it won't. 
Um, I, I continue to look every single day for alternative means of financing. Um, but yeah, it could basically the end of the day, uh, we'd be done. Uh, so that, 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 is, that is a hard reality. And I think a lot of people have gotten to that point ahead of us. Um, it, it, it is one of those things that, that's going to be, you know, a survival, not of the fittest because some fit restaurants have gone for other types of reasons because, you know, timing of expansions they've done, of timing of, you know, the financial situation they were in. Uh, because, you know, you know, the business cycle comes and goes and you may have invested in something. And then I, I know several people just invested in a restaurant and then COVID came immediately thereafter. And they, and when you, when you spend all your money and resources spent building out the interior of a restaurant and then all of a sudden nobody shows up, that's probably the worst possible timing you can get. Yeah. So, like Cheryl, that. as far as the uh, Restaurant Association is concerned, you see this happening. It's yes. happening all the time. You have the, you know, the 50,000 foot level uh, to yes. look at it. I, um, we've talked briefly about uh, some of these national chains, and I suspect, uh, you know, they're equally, you know, stuck. Um, and what about them? Are they, are they uh, going to, you know, are they deep pockets enough to hang around? Or are they going to close their branches here in Hawaii and leave us without the national chains that we go to see? You know, Jay, that part of them are national chains, but many of them are locally owned national chains, right? So McDonald's is an example, right? There's a local family that manages and operates all of the McDonald's. Um, you know, I'm involved in a couple of chain restaurants also, and friends of mine are like the Ruby Tuesday and the Duke Alpha. They're local Kaiser graduates, local guys that invested in the chain. So yes, you're right. You know, they are also in the same situation, just like what Russell and, and um, many of our restaurateurs mentioned. They still have the expenses, Jay, with zero, you know, zero dining room income for the first couple of months. And now our dining room capacity is at 50%. So you basically have 50% of the revenue coming in from your dining rooms, but you still have 100% of your rent and your utilities and your insurance. And all are, you, are, landlords, are landlords giving restaurants a break? I mean, on the thought that if they don't do that, they'll lose the tenant altogether. My, my, my experience, you know, speaking obviously from my limited experience, we have the one in town, which is uh, Kamehameha School. And Kamehameha Schools has stepped up to the plate and told us that they're not going to default us and uh, they will work with us to renegotiate the lease. So we feel pretty comfortable there, um, provided, provided obviously this doesn't go on for <laughs> an extended period of time. Well, but, well, that's the thing. You guys are you know, touching on that and, and, um, uh, and I'm just integrating what, what you're saying with what we hear from other sources. I mean, there's no vaccine, there's no therapeutic, there's, there's no immediate hope here. Um, and the thing is spiking all over the mainland, which has an effect on people's confidence in traveling. Yeah. So, you know, you have a very low possibility of a, a big increase in tourism, even if we really, really, really want it. Um, people are not gonna be comfortable traveling there, especially when, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to find quiet places in the hinterland, you know, in, in, the, in, in the Northwest, yeah, you know, with, um, what was it, um, <clears throat> um, Walden Pond, you know, where there's nobody else around, that sort of thing. <laughs> so I, I just wonder this, though, if we look at this from a, an optimistic point of view, just for a moment, okay, and we say that by the end of the year, there is at least hope and thus confidence. Um, what about your supply lines, Greg? You have to get the food. You have to get the supplies. And those companies are also under pressure because they have no business right now. Restaurant supply is a big business. Um, are you going to be able to put it back together again, uh, say, in next year uh, when, when the coast looks better? Well, there's, a, there's some great questions, and there's a couple of points I want to make. One is I want to talk about our local ag because that's part of our supply chain. So what's happening is our, our local ag doesn't have anybody to sell their agriculture to because it was restaurants, hotels, people that could charge more because locals don't buy local ag, they go to Costco, they go to Foodland, they go to Safeway, et cetera. So what's gonna happen is these, this local ag is gonna go away because there's nobody here to, to buy it. And then what's gonna happen is 
we're going to have lost that that cultural connection to our ag folks, which means so much to us. And then we're going to be reliant on the supply chain coming from the mainland. So what happens is when you're when you have a government like we have now, who gives us hope and then takes it away and then gives us hope and takes it away, that that accordion is felt all through the supply chain. So you're a H and W, you're a Waihata, and you're trying to get enough food on the on the island to be able to source these restaurants. And then one day somebody decides that we're going to pull back dining rooms. Okay, so now you're sitting with warehouses filled with food and restaurants filled with food. So you got to try to sell that. That goes away. So after a couple of those times, suppliers are going to say, not so fast. We're not going to do that. We're going to hold off. And then heaven forbid anything happens on the mainland with any kind of supply chain. And so what happens is we have a lag of getting that food here. And it's all because we have government officials who don't understand how that supply chain works for us, or they're not at this point ready or willing to, to understand it and listen to it. And so supply chain is a huge deal. And what's, what, what hurts me more than anything is that we are going to lose so much of the culture of restaurants on these islands if we don't do something because we're not gonna have that local food. I'm telling you, in, and I'm sure in Russell's restaurants and I know in our restaurants, we use local product right here. We have a pounder's garden. We use, you know, Kahuku Farms and Kupakea Greens and all those things. They can't grow because they just, there's no one to use it. So you're gonna end up being reliant on that supply chain, which is just being jerked around back and forth. Yeah, one more. Go ahead. Go ahead, Russell. I was going to say the other the other issue is you know we've been directly impacted by the problems at the meatpacking plants on the mainland, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Certain cuts of beef that we use, um, because Hawaiian food has has a lot of beef in it, it, it's gone up almost uh, three times. So we've had to not only suffer from um, a lack of demand, we're also suffering from having to raise our prices significantly on certain menu items because the supply chain has been disrupted further upstream. And that of course leads, you know, not, not only to silly Yelp reviews, people complaining about the pricing, uh, but it also leads to reduction in demand, which re, uh, you know, further exacerbates a problem. For us, what you find is that the, the unit size that those suppliers are bringing in from the mainland has shrunk. So the unit price has gone up. Uh, so everything has gone up that gets imported from the mainland already. Um, you know, all produce items are up. So we've started uh, reaching out to some of these local farmers that uh, Greg was talking about. We actually have one farmer who's growing stuff just for us on his land. Nice. He's growing us uh, taralis, luales, and we go out there once a week and we grab them from him. And he's happy to get that. Oh, that's time. great. So it works for everybody. Yeah. So, so it really is, it really is, uh, you know, the consequences of what's going on through the supply chain is, is showing up at a, it, on the diner's plate right now already. Sure. Well, what about the, the, the whole notion of reinvention? I mean, have you, have you uh, changed the rules? I mean, when people come in, do they have to wear masks? Uh, how long can they wear masks before they eat? You know, right. you can't eat with a mask on. Uh, so, and wait staff, do they wear masks all the time? And um, I, I'm asking these questions because I haven't been out. See, I don't know. Um, yep. And do you have plastic, um, you know, plastic uh, pieces yep. that separate people? You have changed the configuration of the tables. Uh, what have you yep. done in terms of the way the restaurant works? Yeah, I mean, pretty much you, 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 you've hit on the, the, the three main things is we have the plastic shields in front of the cashiers, like you may have seen in grocery stores. We have the servers all wearing um, masks and you know changing their gloves, sanitizing the table when people leave, and we space everybody apart. We shut off every other table, and we have like little stickers on the floor telling people where to wait and just keeping everybody apart. But uh, but you know it's it, it, it's again it, I just looked at our security cameras and uh, normally it. <laughs> Normally at lunchtime on a day like today, we have, you know, like 80 people in there. I just looked and we have about 12. Ooh. And, you know, it's that. Well, Jay, I think it's important to remember that part of these guidelines is that we have to reduce our capacity by 50% in all the restaurants. 
So you, you can't even have 100% of your people, uh, of your capacity in there. And in some cases, restaurants can't open their dining room because it doesn't accommodate. It's just too much for them. So they just stay takeout, um, which is really, really sad. Yeah, one thing. One thing well, does anybody come around and take a look and see if you're following the guidelines? We do. We have the health department came out with the new guidance on the placard system. So now, you know, as we have the, the green and the yellow and the red placards that indicate our health inspection status, yeah. um, they've added um, wearing of masks and six feet of social distancing to that placard policy. So inspectors are out. If they, um, if they see you doing it once, you get, an, you get a, a warning. They see you doing it twice, you get closed down. And wow. you're closed for an indefinite amount of period, probably about 24 to 48 hours until you can get back open again and recommit to doing the right thing. Um, so there, so that is out there. So let me ask you this, uh, Greg. You know, everybody talks about reimagining, reinventing. Um, and uh, I would imagine, uh, you know, that would apply to the restaurant industry as well. And so when this is over, um, restaurants are going to be different. I'm sure you think about that. Um, of course, when is the question, but you know, there will be a, a reinvention of things. Uh, I don't know whether they'll all be COVID type of things. Maybe they will be marketing thing, maybe a different, you know, consumer taste, who knows what, but what does the restaurant of the future in Hawaii look like? How would it be reimagined and reinvented? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I think, first of all, you've got the whole new world of takeout that, that has uh, happened. Um, takeout, curbside delivery. Um, I know our restaurant, we did minimal takeout orders, and today it's 20% of all of our sales. And in some restaurants, I'm sure it's a lot more. I think you're going to find that our POS systems and our technology is going to be greatly enhanced. And when it comes to contactless payment and different ways to pay, um, we use at our restaurant Chow Now, which is our takeout, and it's so easy, and that's not a plug for them in particular, but it is so easy and made it so much easier for guests. They just come in, they pick up, it's already paid for. Um, but I think technology, and then I think you're going to have equipment in the back. I think you're going to have um, uh, different parts of our supply chain. And Russell, you're probably already seeing some of it in your restaurants. Yeah, yeah. In fact, we... We jumped on it pretty quickly. We had we, we implemented an online purchasing platform. We implemented curbside delivery. We use uh, we use Alexa uh, to uh, when the car is showing up, it announces a, a car is. Oh, now I've got Alexa talking to me in the background. Do I mention that? <laughs> That's really <laughs> funny. <laughs> so so we have we have we have that device announcing the um, announcing the car's arrival. And the cashiers, as a result, have had to get a little more familiar with technology. They've had to, you know, monitor the iPad, monitor the delivery pad, monitor those sort of things. We also do our own delivery now as well. So we, we actually made a deliberate choice when we selected our location of our restaurant to be in the locations they're in with easy access to driving up, people driving up. So we'd always be in control of our own destiny. So that has helped us now in this particular scenario. So. So we've seen that aspect of technology uh, crop up. So now we're seeing, you know, one third maybe of our payments coming in online. Um, the other thing in terms of reimagining, and this is more my wife's area, but what she's what she's done is she started to work on the presentation of the food in the takeout containers to make sure that when people get it, it doesn't look like it's a shaken up swap. Mm, um, yeah, that's just really important. Yeah, so because when people receive the package, it looks nice. Yeah. So, so we've we've invested we've invested in that, and then the other um, the other aspect is we actually just hired a consultant and got a variance to the DOH code to sell vacuum sealed product. So we're just about to relaunch that because we started it, but the DOH said we couldn't do it until we met their guidelines, and their guidelines didn't exist. So we helped them write them. Um, so once we got that done, which was approved a couple of weeks ago, we're just about to relaunch selling of that. So you, you've seen them, you've seen shrink wrap packaging of food. We're going to start that here locally. So reimagining is we're going to try to get our food into people's dining rooms a little easier that way. Mm -hmm. and, and we're working on shipping with UPS and, and, and that type of thing, you know, refrigerated packaging. and right. those sort of things. So Such so innovation. Thinking, I'm, 
I'm very impressed with the technology, the approach, your innovative approach. Uh, I hope I hope you can get through this, you guys. The, the worst the worst uh, result would be is is you have to fold, and then you know because of your expertise you want to go back into business, but that may mean starting from scratch. What a horrible what a horrible experience that would be because it's hard to open a restaurant. It's hard to make it work. It's hard to um, get people to come around and so forth. So one more question and then we got to go. Cheryl, I want to ask you this. What does the Restaurant Association do for the restaurants right now? Because it's obvious that these guys can help each other. And, and you, are the, you are the exchange program. You are the one that you're the hub and the wheel. Uh, how are you helping them? We're helping them to all of the... As you know, we are uh, affiliated with the National Restaurant Association. So we are the Hawaii location, the Hawaii chapter here. So we're helping them by being sure that all of our national delegates and our local representatives all know what we're looking for. So we are the voice of the food service industry. Well, carry on. They need your help. And Thanks. you guys, I, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very impressed with your fortitude and your creativity. Uh, Greg Maples, um, uh, Russell Ryan, thank you so much. It's been great meeting you. We, we, we kind of more appreciate your restaurant, your effort. I can even taste your food from this discussion. <laughs> Don't be afraid to come and visit us, Jay. Our okay. restaurants are safe in Hawaii. <laughs> thank you, Greg. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Cheryl. Aloha, you guys. Aloha.